So welcome. Our Dharma season is beginning again. It's September. We'll start this evening with a period of sitting quietly together so we can really arrive in the fullest sense of what it means to arrive, to come back home to ourselves and also to our community and to these teachings, which are such important guideposts in our lives. So please take a comfortable seat. You can rest your hands in your lap. Allow your eyes to close. And let's imagine that the swirl of the events of the day, whatever those might be, that that is now fading. As you place yourself here in a kind of centered place, a, a stillness place. As you imagine the swirl of the day's events or the week's events or the, the events of the summer, whatever it might be, as you imagine that becoming more still and more grounded, choose a place for your mind in the physical body or somewhere in the tangible environment that you're in, a place that is actually relatively still. So that could be like the weight of your hands on your knees. or the sense of rootedness in your sitting bones, on your chair, or in your seat. When you encourage your mind to go there, it will all on its own in becoming more focused, it will bring the other layers of your being to that central place as well. You could imagine that the, the act of concentration is like the leader of the parade. And behind this parade leader are all the parts of you that can be in disarray in the swirl of life. And as you concentrate and concentrate and become present, those parts line up into a more organized parade and they come to this destination which we call the present moment.
Allow yourself to keep resting in the stillness, even if around you there is not stillness. Let your mind concentrate, concentrate to become like the leader of the parts of you that would otherwise be wandering around. Now, even though you're concentrating and practicing in your own space, without lifting your awareness away from a tangible place of stillness, start inviting in awareness that others too are practicing, becoming more steady, becoming more grounded. Please join your hands together at your heart. And with appreciation that we get to come together, you may bow your head to your heart. Release your hands. Please open your eyes. Yeah, so this evening I'd like us to look into the kind of sister sciences of Ayurveda and yoga and to have a sense of both where they overlap and how they support each other and then kind of like the unique contribution that some of these sciences have to offer. Initially, when people may hear about meditation or yoga, they think, oh, I can't do that because I can't get still or I'm not flexible. So they feel they cannot practice meditation because the mind will never be blank or it'll never be empty or totally still. And there's an idea that that would be what meditation is. And then also they say they cannot practice yoga because they are not very flexible or they could never reach their toes or they can't slow down that much. 
it was Krishnamurti, I believe, who said, in order to feel that which is immeasurable, to know that which is immeasurable, the mind has to be deeply quiet and very still. And so we could imagine that most people in daily life, they're not in relationship with the immeasurable. They aren't in relationship with that which is vast and which is permeating everything. And it was permeating all these things before we were born. It's continuing to do that now. And it will do that in an onward going way even after we pass on from this physical body. And since most people are not experiencing that or don't have their orientation to that immeasurable or that palpable yet not graspable essence, we might have a hypothesis that human nature needs to remind itself about how to get there. That human nature has created societies in these contemporary uh, sort of urban societies, these what we call dominant culture societies that are very disconnected from that. And we've done so, so successfully in terms of this creation of this society of this connection, we've done it so successfully that it must not have been too hard to lure people to it, to lure our species into this kind of mindset or this kind of mode. It was easily marketed to us or you know easily offered and i think it's helpful to have a a sense of the perspective about why we might have been susceptible to that and if we look at the traditions that are thousands of years old and still alive today still relevant and meaningful and helpful today they tell us that we are susceptible to craving and aversion and that we have a, a deep attachment to who we think of as us we are attached to the self. And we want this self to keep on going to not just survive, but also to be viable and to stay intact. And we want it to keep on going in the way that we know it to be, like in our most familiar knowing of, I am these characteristics or I am these behaviors, I am these roles and responsibilities in my life. So we're so susceptible to this, we're so easily drawn to this like my identification and then add craving and aversion that it wasn't hard to create a society that we see of the kind we live in today here in the global north in the dominant culture that we live in for those of us who are gathered here we mostly identify as this so in fact extricating yourself from this is seems to be the harder task so there are giants who've been amongst us in civilization over many years, uh, many generations who whose teachings you hear, like Krishnamurti, to know that which is immeasurable, the mind must be deeply quiet and very still. Or other people like Thich Nhat Hanh and other mystics who've been here with us in different times, they have pointed in the same direction. Apparently they have to give these teachings because most people are not naturally arriving at the teachings. It takes some difficulty and some suffering to be interested in hearing this other perspective. Sometimes we, we refer to society as the marketplace of life. You're in the marketplace of life. So if you imagine a general marketplace not perhaps the one that you are a part of in a regular way, but the general marketplace of life as let's say um, the mall or a shopping center or a busy downtown commerce area and people are all going about and you see somebody, perhaps they're wearing robes of a certain color and they're standing on a street corner and they're saying, to know the immeasurable, the mind has to be deeply quiet and very still. Now, to be clear, Krishnamurti wasn't wearing robes. I'm just giving a, you know, it would stand out in our society if someone was wearing saffron and burgundy robes on the street corner saying, to know the immeasurable. And they're offering this thing completely free. It's a wisdom teaching. And people are going by. 
you know, and they're looking for the next sale or the next place to shop or they don't have time for this, these teachings. And it doesn't sound that deeply appealing because we've had all of this messaging and marketing about what's going to make our lives satisfying or successful. So it does take some suffering or some friction with that reality that we've man-made, that we have created by all of the privilege and resource that the dominant culture has had. It takes some friction with that. And also it can be aided by a glimpse of the other, like a glimpse of the mystical, a glimpse of the divine. It's often just enough suffering and just enough of the glimpse that you become captivated, like, oh, there's another way to live. There's something more going on here. And often in those reflections, you also realize there's more going on here. It's in incredibly precious and my lifespan is short it's not like a redwood tree you know it's quite a bit shorter than a 500 year old ancient forest and we want to know that thing while we're here and so it becomes captivating and intriguing and then we get these kind of uh, reins as if you had the two reins of a horse and you have yoga and ayurveda to help you navigate how to know this thing that is immeasurable and yet at times it will seem like we have to keep re-navigating every day because the the tug of conditioning and the pull of history in our own bodies and in the body of society that we're a part of you know, the, the place where we live has a strong influence for us so like even the land that you inhabit has a strong influence for example, the absence of nature or the busyness of a freeway nearby your home, living in a more crowded place or a more solitary place, these all have influences on us. So it can seem that every day we're trying to get those reins organized again. And sometimes we feel blessed for a few days or weeks that we kind of got a hum going on. We're in it. Okay, it's you're tasting it, you're resting in it. It feels like it's going to be possible and not ephemeral, but palpable. And then it seems to fall apart again. Like you loosen somehow the reins have their own mind or you drop them or you try to pick something else up and it's hard to hold everything together and some calamity ensues. And yet still there are the reins of yoga and Ayurveda, one in each hand that you can actually use to navigate your life back to tranquility and peace, simplicity. So I was saying, you know, just enough suffering and just enough of a glimpse. And I think that in both cases, a third element is really supportive. It's really critical. And that is a sense of community. So even to have a sense of community in your suffering, to know others who may have had either a similar kind of suffering, which is where I find that the, the entire 12-step community is very helpful to each other, to just know that others are trying to understand their life from addiction into recovery. Or if you've had, as I've had, a couple of brain injuries and you know some other people who've had brain events or neurological events, you're like, okay. We kind of, we really get each other at a different level about what the symptoms are, what it's like to live with an ongoing neurological difference, for example. Or maybe the kind of suffering that you've had is the, the burnout of trying to make a profession. And perhaps it's like slightly against your nature. So it's always a burn. And you know other people who've been there. So that ends the isolation of suffering to know that other people too have have been in that windmill or are currently there or are trying to get out and others have gotten out, you know, as like when the lobster gets out of the pot and it sees the other lobsters that got out, <laughs> you know, it knows the ones that are still back in the pot, but it sees other lobsters got out, it got out. So in some cases we have to reduce the isolation that goes with suffering by finding community. 
and not a community that's going to collude with us in our suffering because that will take us down. Often people use the lobster in the pot image to talk about being taken down because a lobster is climbing out of the pot. Another lobster reaches up and they say that that lobster is pulling its other lobster down. But I wonder if it's trying to use the first lobster as a ladder <laughs> to kind of get out. But fortunately, we are not lobsters. Our brains have more to do than the um, lobsters. However, we do suffer in isolation. It makes it more difficult for us as a species. We can have solitude. You know, we can have inward time or personal time, but we, we don't thrive on isolation, particularly if we're suffering. And just enough of a glimpse, knowing that there's a community that's also interested in that glimpse. It, it adds to your commitment to it. It adds some traction for you. So knowing that others have found freedom or equanimity or health, or also they have come to understand a tradition, a practice, or the teachings, this can be profoundly helpful. And in both cases, yoga and Ayurveda have these kind of tradition-rich experiences behind them. And they were understood and codified by ancient seers, rishis, who could see the subtle body and who could see and, and taste and feel the medicines for Ayurveda. You know, I, I think it's quite phenomenal, in fact, for both Ayurveda and Chinese medicine and other indigenous medicines like this, that somewhere along the way, people were able to sense the medicine in these plants by sensing it, by being with it, not only having experiments with it, but really being with the medicines and Chinese medicine also uses um, different parts of animals and roots and bugs and foliage. And I, it's phenomenal what they've come to know. I personally have had Chinese medicine formulas that I cook on the stove that make the house smell so bad. You think it'll be like that forever. Um, but as we say, taste bad, work good. And some of those formulas had flying squirrel poop was an ingredient. Uh, I know it's like, who thought of that? Sorry, Edward. <laughs> Sorry. Who ever thought that was going to be medicinal or the, um, the, uh, the shell that the cicada drops when it's molting, that is apparently medicinal. And some things, you know, they just like look like barks and twigs and other things, but you never know what I had to ask my Chinese doctor, what's in here? What am I, what is it? What is it doing? Also, I want to know. In a similar way, Ayurveda uses medicines, uh, though I have not heard them using any medicine that comes from animals. So it, it is from the uh, plants and roots and herbs and such like this. So knowing that people, they sensed, they listened, they connected with nature, and they, they could hear what was in the subtle medicine of these plants and these roots. And they could also sense the subtlety of our opportunity as a physical human body. And by that subtlety, I mean things like the marma points, the acupuncture points, the five elements. Both of these indigenous traditions have five elements, though they have different names for those five elements. They each have a five element tradition, five element acupuncture, for example. In Ayurveda, these five elements are earth, water, fire, air, and ether, as you know. These ancestor yogis and, and seers, they could also sense the subtlety, not only of the marma points, but of the nadis overall, the nadis, the subtle nervous system of the whole body. And they could sense that there were primary nadis. So Ida and Pingala, the primary nadis, the utmost is the shushumna, the central channel nadi. They could sense that too. And then they could sense how the nostrils we're gonna influence the nadis and the hemispheres of the brain that went with that. And they could sense all of that influencing the nervous system, which then moves from a subtle body to a more dense body. The nervous system, we, can, we call it a more dense body, it's dense and subtle mixed together because it actually has nerve pathways that can be seen and touched and felt and so on. Um, the most dense of the physical body is, of course, the muscles and bones, the 
this thing that we think of as our body and our form, we think of it as us. Um, once they had these seers and they could sense these things, then people also became practitioners, in some cases, teachers of the tradition that they had learned. And in some cases, people became aspirants or sannyasins. They became students of the yoga practices, students of meditation, and they became the patients of Ayurvedic medicine. So to look at these two sister sciences side by side, there is a distinction to be made. Ayurveda is a profound science of health and well-being. It's self-healing, self-empowering. It can be, we, we, we say it that way because though you, it is recommended to have a vaidya, a doctor, who's checking your pulses, seeing your tongue, and who is objective. The doctor who is not going to say that, it, you know, for you, Fruit Loops is a good breakfast because it's multicolored. So you might have your, if you have your own doctor, you have a kind of fool for a patient, we say. Um, but once you have the medicines from the doctor, once you have the guidance, it is self-healing and self-empowering because you can actually act on it. You can do it. It's something that there's a kind of freedom or liberation to that. It's, it's given to you now to make use of versus being dependent upon the doctor to administer it every single time. Right? In the same way about yoga, we say also, once you understand the technologies and you're practicing according to what a teacher might guide you to do, it's self-healing and self-empowering. However, Ayurveda is meant to be a system of whole body health to help all of the systems of your physical body function at their best and to clear out the debris so that as you practice something like yoga, you'll be there entirely. There'll be a lot less to work through in your yoga practice. And by that, we mean there's less rubbish <laughs> in the system. And so, for example, if we look at Ayurveda and it recommends a certain dinacharya, a certain daily cycle for health, we look at yoga, it happens to line up with that. Ayurveda recommends rising with the sun. Yoga recommends practicing yoga at sunrise. So they happen to line up. Ayurveda recommends not eating past a certain time of night because it's not good for your sleep nor your digestion. If you think of it in the most primitive terms as well, it would not have been good for your survival because eating at nighttime in the dark in a climate that required fire would tell the predators where you are and you would become food for others, for other creatures bigger than you. So it made sense according to the survival nature of the species. Um, but it also makes sense if you're going to wake up for your morning yoga practice that you have had enough time to digest and eliminate and be ready for your yoga practice. So they, again, do line up there. Ayurveda will also recommend when you're looking at what your meal times are that it lines up with the cycles of the sun. And yoga recommends you do not practice yoga in the hot sun. You do not practice in the sun exposed area. So they do have a lot in common in this regard. But insofar as there's a distinction, Ayurveda is looking at creating the, the optimal health to support you in having optimal health. Yoga is helping you to want to transcend, to understand, to pierce through the veil into consciousness itself. And so the more depth we want in our yoga practice, the more commitment we'll end up making in Ayurveda because it will help us to gather less rubbish, less debris. We'll have less cleanup to do every day. So insofar as Ayurveda is addressing what they would consider to be the dense body, so that's going to be the physical body, the lymph, the digestive, the immune, the nervous system, and all the ways in which the marma points become clogged or blocked like a trigger point, a congealing kind of thing in your energy body, similar to a trigger point in a muscle, in the muscle and bone body. Ayurveda wants to help you clear all of that out on a daily basis. And then stop accumulating by eating the wrong types of food at the wrong time of day for the dosha that you are not, <laughs> for example. 
yoga is going to take that a step further into this um, the codes of conduct for living with yourself and with others and also the the practices that help your mind to really go into that immeasurable to understand that which is deeper than that which is more abiding than and that which has always been here and welcomed you when you arrived and will be here beyond your lifespan. What has happened when yoga came to the West is that it became much more about the dense body and we kind of captivated there for a couple of decades. I'd say, you know, relative to the lifespan of the species, that's not too long to be captivated by something that we didn't really understand. So, you know, yoga came over in with the, um, I guess it was the world, uh, some sort of forum. And I think it was Vivekananda who came over initially many, many decades back, way before you thought of yoga as yoga. And they were talking about it as a practice for peace, for world peace. Even when yoga was at the um, Swami Satchidananda was at the Woodstock Festival, you know, that was about peace and love and harmony and much less about the physical asana where we got a little detour for decades into this physical body, physical body, physical body yoga. And while that still dominates the general landscape of consumer yoga, there's far more people interested in the, the deeper, more true yoga practices. So I think the detour is, is not likely to be long lived. Uh, and the more people who come to understand yoga at its essence, then that's going to infiltrate our society more and more. Okay. However, since it came over for the physical body first, a lot of people lost um, the understanding of or didn't have access to understanding that it was a much deeper practice than that. It truly is, the Hatha Yoga Pradipika is just a, a, a sort of short handbook of the things you can do physically to arrive for meditative access, to arrive in a place of balance. Insofar as Ayurveda is pointing to us on the physical plane, how to have ideal lifestyle for the, the pursuit of yoga, then there are these different qualities um, that we kind of embody them now. We have them in our nature and we're going to pursue different kinds of yoga. So if somebody with enough Ayurveda and mental health, they might be very interested in the yoga sutras and they may take a more mental process into yoga. But somebody else may arrive in that state of well-being and feel this, this quality of generosity that wants to come through them. They may pursue the path of karma yoga, the yoga of service. In both cases, there are um, written technologies and recommendations to follow the yoga sutras and then the, the yoga of service or of action in the Bhagavad Gita. Mm -hmm. And somebody else may need to have the daily physical practice. They feel like when they go into that physical realm, it awakens so much for them. The richness of yoga is revealed again and again. And keep going deeper. So according to your inclination, you're going to pursue a certain kind of yoga in that regard. Um, so I've come after, you know, 35 years of, yep, at least 35 years of practice of yoga. I've come to see, I, I couldn't live my yoga without the Ayurveda. It would be like, you know, a daily struggle in a way to, to just keep showing up on one's mat. Like one of my friends used to say, we come to the yoga mat to detox. We go back into life and we retox. Then we have to detox. Then we have to retox. Then we have to detox. And that being said, I would not understand the deep power of Ayurveda if I didn't have a yoga practice. Because I'm so tuned into my physical body and all the systems of my body that I can feel with great sensitivity the power of the Ayurvedic medicine and the, the power of eating, digesting, all these things. So I, re I really personally cannot separate them, um, but there is an important distinction to see that each of them has texts and they have guidelines for living. And while one is there to really promote this transcendence into consciousness and grace, the other is there for a sacred relationship to 
the ecology, the animals, the the uh, the plants, the society in which you live, and the intelligence of your own body, and to bring all of that into a blessing. There's more overlap than not, but I, I do want us to sense that they are sister sciences with slightly different orientations for us. So having said what I've said so far, I'd like to pause and see what questions you have, because I want to spend some time tonight then talking about why those rains keep falling from our hands and why it is so difficult, often so difficult to bring it back into focus. But let's see what, what are the questions that are hovering around right now. Shannon, yeah. Hi, Sarah Joy. Um, in our, my training previously, you had language to distinguish the sister sciences um, that was helpful. And because I'm in transition, I don't have access to that. So I'm wondering if you could restate that. If I could and restate it. It was very simple. Yeah, it was just really simple. It was like yoga is this arm and Ayurvedic um, practices is, would be this arm. And I don't remember what you said. And oh, maybe yeah. you don't either. You're I, asking someone I, who has any grace. <laughs> right. I, I give you grace. <laughs> yes. Because I definitely understand. Yeah. You know, I don't know if I could make a, a specific strong distinction in that way right now. Um, okay. I don't think I have access to it at the moment, Shannon. That's but if okay. it comes yeah. back to me or it comes to you, please vocalize it. Yeah, it was just something really simple. And yes, if it pops back to you or me, I will. I will share it on my end. Great, thank you. Thanks. Mm -hmm. How about other questions or um, even things that you resonate with or observations? Yes, Edward. Greetings, Sarah Joy, nice to see you. Um, Hi. Uh, I have a, a question came up when we first started doing, uh, when we first did our meditation, uh, a, a question was invoked. And I'm curious, is it, a, is it your view that the stillness and meditation is created through the practice of meditation or discovered through the practice of meditation? Yeah, the stillness that we're referring to does not need us to create it. That's what I think. Yeah, it's more like remembering it. Um, Thank you. It's like falling thought. back into it, falling back to it, you know. We're of the same mind. Uh, that's, that's sometimes different people have different views, so I thought I'd clarify that. And I think one of the great things you mentioned in your um, introduction is I think I found as it as a yoga teacher, it's so helpful to remind our teachers, as you eloquently said, that um, we're practicing our yoga within the context of the human condition. And our yoga practice is not going to make the human condition magically disappear. <laughs> um, but through the practice, we can create a more healthy relationship with it. Yes. Yeah. And that's one of the great struggles that I think um, many people, because of the way the human condition takes over their lives, they end up really in very poor health, mental or physical. And it's so normalized that we acclimate to levels of poor health, but then have to escalate further and further until we have specialized medical care for these symptoms that have now become amplified and yet in their original form the symptom was something like um, digestive upset and it could have been handled in a more simple form or it's um, some sleepless nights and you realize oh the impact of that if you're really in tune with your body and your mind you realize the impact of that on yourself and so it doesn't have to become an ongoing chronic and amplified health condition however we are living in a society where many health conditions are rapidly increasing. Um, endocrine disorders like diabetes, type 1, type 2, type 3, 
type three diabetes is often referred to now as um, like moving into Alzheimer's or Alzheimer's might be referred to as type three diabetes. Um, we have chronic insomnia for which people are having a really difficult time finding relief uh, outside of medication. And, and so as, insofar as the human condition keeps escalating into further and further symptoms and imbalances, and we try adding more specialized Western medicine to help fix that problem inside of a society that is quite ill. So it's hard to get well when you live in a sick society. It's hard to get well by using the societal methods, which is also why I think the indigenous teachings of both Chinese medicine, Ayurveda, and of course, yoga, the indigenous teachings and medicines are so helpful. They're really asking us to surrender so much, to give up a lot so that we can remember what's more valuable than what we're giving up. And that is another common ground between Ayurveda and yoga is the amount of surrender that's asked of us. Mm -hmm. um, for some people giving up late nights, for example, or giving, you know, it's very difficult for, even for the Indians at the Ayurveda center where I was just, I had spent five weeks earlier this summer for my therapies. The Indians, according to the doctors, who are also Indian and were speaking to me, uh, they like to say that the Indian patients complain a lot more about the food. I didn't complain about the food. They say the Indian patients complain a lot more about the food because it's not spicy enough or salty enough for them. And like even in their society, the amount of spice and flavor and salt in the food is, it's a lot. And they don't recognize that that much spice or salt or rajasic nature in the food is causing some of their illnesses. And since they're eating the same spices, more or less, but adding, you know, excess or excess um, other kinds of oils and, and things that are not so healthy for them. When they go to Vajagram, they're like, oh, the food is so bland. Now, I'm an American and I go and I think, wow, this is so delicious. This is so medicinal. This is so helpful to me. It's so wonderful that it's delivered to my room. It's so, you know, nourishing. I feel so cared for. Um, so you are asked to surrender quite a bit to come back to this indigenous body that you were born into and, and to know that stillness that we're falling back into in meditation. So therein does lie the question, I think um, Edward is pointing to it by bringing up the human condition again. And the, the question is, well, what makes it so hard every day to regain some leadership with those two reins in your hands? And if we have access to this, these bodies of knowledge, which we do, those of us who are gathered here, we do have access to the bodies of knowledge. We also have each other. We have a sense of community. We have a sense of the traditions, which is a much larger community than we can be here on Zoom in one evening. But why is it difficult to have that kind of self-leadership that helps those two reigns to really beautifully operate your life for you to give you the clarity and sanity and vitality that you want. Well, sometimes we may be on a very stormy ocean, you know, different life events that come and the, the ocean can move quite a bit. So knowing how to tack our own boat on such an ocean is a skill. On the other hand, some of the storminess of the ocean, we could prevent with things like foresight, often based on hindsight. So foresight might be, you know, sensing that persons A and B are less auspicious for you to hang out with than, you know, persons D and E. And so when you're scheduling your time, who, who to be with and who to say no thank you to and whose company to spend time in and how to show up for those connections. That is something that we can start sculpting in our lives. Not a hundred percent, of course, we have coworkers, we have family members, we have relatives. And, you know, I just went to a family reunion and I also uh, met with my Dharma teacher on zoom. She's a friend of mine, not, not only my teacher. And so we talk more casually and she had gone to a family reunion, so we got to talk about family reunions. <laughs> what is, what's it like, you know, to be there and to still be seen as an oddball in your family system? 
not by everybody, but certainly by many people. Um, so there are some people in our lives that we will have to learn to be in good relationship with. But there's also foresight about with whom to spend time and how. And foresight about which, let's say, jobs or responsibilities or tasks to take on and which ones not to take on. And the, the question that we're asking often, if we really frame it according to yoga, is, is this going to be for my highest good? In my world, the question is, will it serve the highest good for me so I can be of service to the greater good of the whole? It isn't just my personal highest good that I'm interested in. And so when we ask those questions, you know, is this, we could simplify it down to a question like, is this nourishing for me? Is this going to create more sattva or more rajas or tamas? Mm -hmm. So holding on to that sense of self-leadership with these two reins in our hands, sometimes it is a moment to moment recalibration. You're catching yourself. One of my friends used to say, if the coffee mug, if the two fingers are around the handle of the coffee mug, he'd say he knew he was not going to meditate that morning. He had to make a left in the hallway, not a right into the kitchen. You know, like sometimes it's a moment to moment recalibration, just like that, realizing you have to take a pause or a time out or give yourself the chance to recalibrate. And other times it's like you have to watch yourself like a scientist studying ants. And you're looking at this particular ant part of yourself like, oh, there she goes again towards the drawer where the lollipops are. Oh, there she goes again towards the, I don't know, the cabinet where the Dr. Pepper is. I mean, I don't go there. I have my own forms of those things, but it's not lollipops and Dr. Pepper. <laughs> but just watching, okay, there goes, I know what that's going to look like. The, the scientist of the mind is watching this pattern. Okay, well, gathering some debris tomorrow morning is going to feel a little harder. Is that really what you want for the outcome? Mm -hmm. And never in a stern way. It's not like you're being knocked on the knuckles with a ruler. But there's things that we do know about ourselves and our susceptibility. And it's very difficult to keep regaining that self-leadership all day long. It can start feeling fatiguing. Like, why do I have to constantly be doing this? Why do I have to always be navigating these this, this horse? Well, the horses in this kind of analogy are the senses, the, the five senses that pull us astray. So rather than just navigating with the two reins and what can I do not to keep falling into a rabbit hole, we can also ask, what can I promote to make this easier for myself? What can I promote? What kind of environment can I promote for myself? What, what kind of structures can I put in place to promote my, my better choices? And I would say, well, there's many things that community is, again, one of those things. It's really important. I'm going to pick up my own thread there in a few moments, but I would like to come to Derek, whose hand was up, and then go to Edward. Um, when you were mentioning there a minute ago, the, you know, choosing who to spend time with and, you know, how like some people won't be serving us in our greater good and towards our higher selves and that sort of thing. Um it brings to mind both like wondering about processes for like, you know, having these long friendships and then eventually having to grieve the fact that those people are no longer part of healthy patterns nor growth and just grieving in general as somebody who's also lost some people really close to me lately and from just moving on and death and things. Yes. Um, our society doesn't seem to, you know, have a lot for that, let alone. Um, and those are the two things that kind of come to mind with that. Yes. Um, and, you know, ironically, indigenous teachings like in India, the, the passage of a person's life and there's a lot more ritual around it. And it's, it's not hidden. It's not, it's not cloistered from society. It's a part of society. It's an important part of society there. Um, I mean, so important <clears throat> Where I travel to one of the places we go to is Varanasi, which is a very, very important pilgrimage site for Indians, in a, in a way, all over the planet, for those who can get there. And it, it is the place where you see the burning ghats, if you've ever seen that in a film or you've seen some magazine articles or something about it. And you can go. They just had this beautiful redesign of some of the ghats that were 
in disrepair. It's an incredible um, kind of upgrade to the far end of the guts. And just beyond those guts, you can see the burning grounds and they've expanded the numbers of burning grounds there. And you can watch even as a, a non-native person, you can go and stand and and watch the the whole ritual be a part of it. And it's really significant, very important. Including you can be walking through the marketplace of Varanasi and you'll see a family coming through with chanting and music and sounds and, and on the um, hands overhead, they're carrying someone who has deceased and is wrapped in the, the gold foil that they wrap the bodies in. And they're, they're coming through the village essentially, which is now a city, of course. And it's and everybody steps aside and they go through and the cows are following them because now there's an opening in the crowd so the cow can get through too. And it's all a part of the life there. But you asked another question that I think is really significant in terms of why we sometimes do also get timid about these paths here in the West. And that is friendships and longtime connections that may not, they may not be oriented to yoga as or um, mindfulness or service or contemplation in the way that you want to be. And so it, it can feel like we're going to be out of step with people. And there is an appropriate kind of mourning or sadness about that. It also, since I mentioned earlier, the recovery communities, it also happens in a recovery community where you may be someone who's moving towards recovery and others are still in their addiction. Um, and there is a kind of um, appropriate healthful grieving about that while also then role modeling. And I would say um, keeping the lights on as if you were becoming a lighthouse, keep the lights on in case one of your friends does need the light beam to find the shore. And sometimes it can be helpful to even have, this is very common in India to have an altar or a place of worship or a place of practice. And frequently you'll you'll put something for your ancestors there, people that you have loved who've gone to the other side. But you could also put a friendship, something about the friendships that haven't been able to sustain as you grow in a certain direction, but always wishing them well and letting them know, even at like a psychic level, letting them know I'm here if you ever need to find this light. I'm I'm available. Um, and so the connection doesn't have to be something that is like completely lost, right? Um, but it can be challenging because you may not want to go to the same marketplace that your friends want to go to. Yeah. I think, you know, for my current circumstances in life where my brain is still very sensitive and there are things I definitely could not do. I, I would not go to a mall. I, I would not be able to handle the situation. I prefer not to go downtown. I couldn't walk around the city blocks right now comfortably. It would be exhausting. So if people wanted to do an activity that was normal for them, but not attuned to me, I'd have to explain why I can't do it. And Usually my friends are pretty respectful about that. But one does wonder, you know, will that will that stand the test of time? You know, and I don't particularly have friends who go to malls and hang out downtown on street corners, but uh, just saying, if, will that stand the test of time? I don't know yet. Mm -hmm. I hope that's somewhat helpful, Derek. Imagine you're facing some things right now starting a business and you have a full commitment there for this amazing service you want to provide. And some of your friends may find that you're occupied or busier than they would want you to be. That can happen too. Okay, let's go to Edward and then I'll, I'll go to Shannon and then I'll try to pick up my other thread back away. So Edward. Thank you. Um, you're talking about a, a way of living and with uh, with uh, some traditional references, such as Ayurveda and traditional Chinese medicine. And while, while you've been talking, I, I'm being consistently reminded of a new series called The Blue Zones, which is on Netflix. If 
And since that's so available for most people, um, if you haven't seen it, I'd highly recommend it. The Blue Zones was an interesting study about where do people live the longest, healthiest lives? Mm. It's a series about how people are living in a more traditional way. And some um, some are even living in the context of modern society, but they're living into their hundreds without disease and they're happy and relatively healthy. And, um, you know, they're not sannyasins or mm -hmm. billionaires. Um, they're ordinary people, but they're living in a very common, ordinary way, which I think is very um, accessible to our circumstance. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it's very relative. And I think uh, the practice of yoga aligns quite well with uh, the principles of the Blue Zone. So mm -hmm. you can find it on YouTube or on Netflix, or you can find mm -hmm. it on Amazon, but I highly recommend it. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, that's wonderful. And let's go to Shannon. Hi. Hi. Um, so when you mentioned things like the Global North, um, I don't know exactly what that means, simply because when we're talking about things like um, grief rituals or um, honoring those who've transitioned, ancestor altars, which are very much a part of the African, African American, and Black community. And, you know, not every home, um, but most homes that I know, that is a part of the ritual of our existence. Yeah. Um, and I think, so when, when I hear of this like global North, I also think about my um, Latinx community members who also participate in rituals like that. And so this kind of like lumping together the global North when we're talking about these types of things seems to be missing. I, I don't feel included in it necessarily. Mm -hmm. Early, and that's, I think, what um, I'm, I'm speaking to because these rituals, I mean, even in the Jewish community, there's amazing grief rituals and processes. So there's a lot of these things that are that are in community for many um, culture or ethnic groups mm -hmm. that I don't know. Right, that's what I was saying, Paula. Yeah, yeah. The Latinx Mexican community, right, that are not being spoken to, that are adjacent or very similar, and if we really want to drill it down, they have an origin in, you know, not popular belief. Africa, all of this kind of comes through time out of. Um, one place and has transformed over history through different area you know the whole world was one big continent right and then yes. spread apart so yes. we're all yeah. um very interconnected so I think as I listen to this and this um statement about the global north there's yes. the two phrases something. together the global north and the dominant culture of the global north um, which the, is what of uh, the post-industrialized euro euro endocentric living the dominant culture of the global north are the people with the most privilege and power um and this are... is mostly caucasian so i'm i'm referring to those terms because when i'm studying in terms of the uh climate change and the ecological um, disaster that we're facing and the scientists that I'm following, when they refer to the damage done, they're pointing to the dominant culture of the global north, uh, which means above the equator, as um, I think, if I haven't said that, I'm remiss in not saying it, but it means above the equator. And then dominant, oh, dominant culture are the cultures that have dominated the, the mindset of industrialized and post-industrialized living, the mindset of the those who we we can th think of those who've colonized those who've taken over those who've made um uh, enough power in their society or civilization to create like 
an empire mindset. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's what they're referring to when they use the phrase. And that's what I'm referring to when I use the phrase dominant culture of the global north or the global north and the dominant culture that lives here. Mm -hmm. Right. I, I feel like when we're talking about spirituality and we're talking about the topic of conversation tonight, it is important to be clear that the dominant global north we're talking predominantly white bodies and to to say that and to recognize that there are large numbers of communities that do not identify ethnically as white bodied mm -hmm. and are still practicing in their indigenous form even if they haven't been connected to their land mm -hmm. um, for a long time and so this disconnect has unique experiences for each individual. And that's all I'm offering as I hear this, I want to really drop in um, to it, but it feels like I'm excluded from it because I don't identify with this mm -hmm. dominant global North. And I think that's what I'm offering. Yeah, and, and in fact, I would recommend that we identify with it less and less, <laughs> that we aren't, mm -hmm. we don't allow ourselves to become so much. One of the ways that I've talked about it in other settings is the dominant culture attitude, the dominant culture mindset of the global north can influence people who who move here, who live here, who could have idolized this, who've been fascinated by it, but won't ever have the same privilege that those who have generated it have. And it has a, a kind of... um colonizing of the mind it takes over the mind yeah. Um, yeah. So then people's orientation moves away from what would have ever been indigenous for them as well uh, so i'm not recommending that we join up with dominant culture and uh, insofar as i'd like to be less and less um, identified with it or connected to it and yet i'm a part of it i am a caucasian female and i've had a certain privilege in my life i want to also able to take responsibility for the ways in which how I have lived has contributed to the dominant culture perpetuating. And that may be things like how I make purchases or how I've owned property because I do own the property that I live on. I want to really be cognizant of those things for myself and look deeply into what are the reparations that I can also be a part of. Um, I hope that's somewhat helpful to, to reflect on. Absolutely. And I think what it takes me back to really quickly is that, you know, you were, what was beautiful that you said earlier was that each of us will be drawn to a certain way of practicing. Mm -hmm. And I think also in that way of practicing, really honoring and speaking to the fact that uh, you this is an example, not accurate. You may feel more distant from these practices than I might. These practices may initially feel more intuitive to me based on this idea of this global north and the dominant and being disconnected and not, you know, but much of what yoga te is teaching is so resonant to me and my community. It's like second nature. And it's a validation and a, um, it is a remembering, but it, it is in a different way. And so I just wanted to really offer that. So as we speak about this, there's this, in the same way, there's this awareness that there's different yogas that speak to different people, the experiences and the proximity to the spiritual medicine will be different based on yeah. our connection to our indigenous roots, whatever our even if we are Caucasian, they're still indigenous roots. Yes, yes. And that's where yoga and Ayurveda, they want to point people back to that indigenous relationship to the earth and the elements and that we could become people who sensed in the plants themselves what the medicine is there. Like we'd be able to return to that kind of sensitivity, which would also allow us to have greater sensitivity to each other and to our shared and mutual responsibility for those who are our need and those for whom we can offer, we can lend a hand or we can um, connect more honestly and authentically. Oh. 
Absolutely. I think this time in our society where Ayurveda and yoga here in the West are becoming more known, but first, of course, they get consumerized. They get um, compromised. They get marketed. They get tailored into a little package. And that does provide some relief for people, but sometimes the relief that gets provided keeps them suspended longer in the cultural mindset that they live in now because the remedies are helping them to stay in a certain life, in a certain out of balance life. But now they have ashwagandha where they have uh, chitavari. You know, they have something that's going to keep them going in that. So in a way, the the packaging of what yoga and Ayurveda are here in the West is helping people to keep going in the same kind of dominant culture mindset here, which hopefully that is a, they start to feel more and more that the medicine is offering them something, including a departure from dominant culture thinking, a departure from thinking mostly in terms of merchant culture, which is another way that we sometimes talk about it. And thinking in terms of themselves as a commodity or their work as a commodity and things are to be possessed um, or owned for a time. But unfortunately, our society is so uh, interested in marketing to the parts of us that have craving and aversion that it's easy to give now new packaged Ayurveda. Um, this is also why I'm very personally committed to the Ayurveda and yoga that come from the subcontinent of India, where the, the teachings are more and more authentic there. And of course, in India, they're also getting compromised. It does happen there too, because it's a part of the human mindset that we're able to, we look for advantages and we need to, to gain some traction or to have some you know, some greater sense of our viability or survivability. So we want to make money, for example. Once commerce became what it is today, it's, it's very damaging to societies everywhere. So going back, and thank you, Chanan, for that. It's very helpful. Um, and also to, to include the people who, they are closer to those indigenous medicines because they got, they didn't have to get quite so far from them, but all people have indigenous roots at some level to get back to. And the earth, one of my recent phrases is like, nature sees us all equally. Human-made societies don't, but nature sees us all equally. Like the, the shade of the oak tree is there for anybody who wants to take refuge in that shade. And, and at the same time, the sense that humans have created so much division and divisiveness is very much against what would be indigenous to our species. So if we look at what makes it hard to hold on to the two reins of yoga and Ayurveda, and I very frequently am talking to students who come to see me for either individual support or uh, sometimes it's a small group support. And I very frequently hear them say, like, I know what I'm supposed to be doing, but I'm not doing it. Or the day started off okay, and then it was a total wash. I did okay until five o'clock, and then it kind of went downhill. Or I'm okay during the week, but the weekend is terrible. Or like, I do okay on the weekends, but when I go back to work, you know, it doesn't work. So I'm regularly talking to people for whom they have a sense of the schedule, the routine, the sleep, the food, the practices, all the things that could help them. But it's so difficult to maintain. And it's difficult to establish it in a life that has a certain pace and a certain rhythm and certain um, expectations or standards too. And of course, we have we live in a society that requires us to pay taxes and be a part of the the larger structures that are like, keep up and pay your bills and all these things. So it's complicated. But what are some of the key things that cause us to loosen the reins and we just get derailed all during the day? If you really go down to it, there are these minuscule disconnections that begin to happen between you and your deepest inner knowing or between you and your body, between you and your breath, these little like micro tears of, of consciousness separating from you and you separating from it um, because of things like distractions and uh, when our senses are already overwhelmed and often they are already overwhelmed it's easier to have stuff flood in and then it's easier to feel 
taken over by those senses. They're called sense impressions. And to lose your grip on the rains. So partly it's trying to keep a sense of the structure of the riverbanks of yoga and Ayurveda in your life. And then having your life be the river that's flowing between those. When people start to lose leadership over something like staying hydrated or not finding their hand in the bag of popcorn or remembering that they, they wanted to scrape their tongue upon wakening, but they went to the coffee first and they didn't do it. When we're losing that kind of leadership frequently, we're also slowly eroding our sense of confidence in ourselves to be a person who could have that kind of leadership. So with that erosion, we become less and less likely to be able to regain the permission. We become more submissive to our instincts and our senses. And we often don't realize that we're doing it. And when I say we, I'm, I'm going to just talk about the general human condition is capable of doing that. I'm not pointing fingers at all of you who are gathered here tonight as having that, but we all do have some susceptibility to, to this, uh, like, erosion of our primary commitments to stay in grounded, centered, tranquil, of service, connected, and so on. And let me go back to Shannon. Well, I, I thought you asked a question. Oh, yes. Go ahead. Step right in. Yeah. Okay. I think what the that what I was going to offer is from my own personal embodied experience and in working with clients, the word I would use is dissociation, like that disconnection of the brain and the body is the first thing that I find myself working with, with myself and client. Mm -hmm. And that drops into um, awareness and um, pause, um, like, or slow, just slowing down into yeah. awareness. That's usually where I'm starting um, with myself <laughs> every moment of every day. And what I'm trying to work with my clients on um, in trying to come into um, a more balanced existence. Yeah. And I think it's helpful, Chen, and I use the word dissociation. I was talking about these like minuscule separations from oneself. And there's certainly gradations of this, but dissociation is connected to like when the vata dosha pulls us away, when we become vata imbalanced or sometimes it's called vata deranged which let's think of it as a spectrum so vata imbalanced happens before vata deranged and vata is the first dosha that goes out of balance because it's the most mobile and then it pulls the other doshas with it so frequently we're just trying to bring the vata dosha back in back in back into the present moment back into the body and so the susceptibility of that kind of disconnection that we have it as we see it happening to us, the frequency with which it happens, the times of day that it happens can become so regular, you know, like after lunch, it happens for you, or if the boss calls, or um, if the spouse looks at you the wrong way, you can get derailed. So the numbers of these um, disconnections or dissociations, as they pile up, it erodes our sense that we could right the ship. And so people sometimes have this happen like early in the morning and they're like, the day is a wash, the day's ruined. I'll never get it back. Okay. Or it happens mid afternoon. Okay. I'll start again tomorrow. Tomorrow I'll bring this back tomorrow. I'll be on my yoga mat or it's happening now it, on a longer scale. I'm going to be dysregulated for a week. I can't wait till Sunday. Well, I'm, I'll get more calibrated on Sunday. Okay. Well, wait, when I get that vacation, I'm going to, you know, and you start to feel kind of breathless that you're never going to catch up on the, the treadmill of these disconnections. And so one of the things about bringing Ayurveda and yoga in is we can bring our vata dosha back home. We can bring our breath back into our body. We can find a community member to connect to. We can connect with a tree. We can put our feet on the earth. We can lie down on the ground for a few moments or on the bed if that's what we have. So to be able to come back any moment, even if you feel like the day is a wash, but if you regain it right there at like 10 a.m., you're like, wait a second, I regained some leadership. Going along pretty good. By noon, it's a wash again. Oh, wait a second. Oh, it's too hard, too hard today. But the numbers of times that we regain that and regain it and regain it, instead of 
having our confidence eroded, our confidence is building. And this is something that Eknath Esquarn talks about all the time in his writings. And one of the analogies that he uses, <laughs> that he's just like a, a, a loving, uh, cheerful grandfather who was also deeply studied and very capable of teaching the, the teachings of yoga and meditation and, and um, the Bhagavad Gita. He says, even if you lose the round, stay in the ring because you're going to win the match. It's like every time your samskaras come and they get in the ring with you, you think you're going to lose that round of the, the larger match, but stay with it, stay with it, stay with it because you're going to win ultimately. He's, he's talking about perseverance and, and not allowing those kind of what I call um, micro disconnections or minuscule separations. Don't allow them to erode you time and again. For every time we regain it, we're going to strengthen our confidence that we can do it. And so that might mean stopping in like mid stride and going, okay, lum, lum, lum. Or mid, mid hand in bag of popcorn. <laughs> You've got your fingers on the popcorn, dropping it, closing the bag, stepping away, realizing what you're doing. If if popcorn is one of your rabbit holes that you go down, I'm not, I'm not demonizing popcorn. Please don't misunderstand. Or the, you know, you're about to crack open the the Pepsi, and you realize, yeah, it's cold and quite a quote unquote refreshing, and I also know it's chemically made, and it's going to move my blood sugar, and it's going to change my vata dosha, and it's, but it's so satisfying right now, so I, I want this thing because the short term brain that wants satisfaction and relief right now will win out unless the long-term brain, which is your neocortex, can really help you to regain those reins on these two horses all throughout the day. So one of my recommendations is that we do check and see where we start to get derailed and derailed and derailed and we bring it back, we bring it back. It will be less and less difficult and less and less tiresome to do it. A second recommendation I have is that we have portals of empathy. We know where to go to connect with somebody because sometimes these little derails that are happening, they're like happening inside of you. Even if you're in a social setting, they're happening inside of you. And it's a slight disconnect from yourself and also from others. And then access to empathy is reduced and our fortitude is reduced. And we end up succumbing to the sort of habitual ways that we comfort ourselves when that disconnection is happening. So portals of empathy, a place to connect and to have that be so consistently available for you that thinking of it brings you relief in the same way that thinking cigarette or brownie or Pepsi brings relief for some people. So th this regaining of your leadership and these portals of empathy are, are two things. A third thing I would recommend is that you make some standing commitments to yourself that are non-negotiable. And one of those is meditation, a consistent daily time for your meditation. I have a um, light sensor, so I had to wave my arm to get it to turn back on, excuse me. So a, a daily consistent time for the practices that you know, they give you the internal fortitude. They help you to overcome the residue and they clear up the, the mind to have that leadership again and again. We know we can train our minds for this. And we know that we need to. As we're doing it, our senses are gonna become more stabilized. So we'll have less flooding in where if your senses are porous and they are very porous after a concussion. So I know I'm not the only person in this Zoom room who's either has or has had a concussion. Your senses are very porous when you're under chronic stress. With PTSD, the senses are made more porous. With certain neurological sensitivities, more porous. And so we, we have to be able to support our senses to be not quite so susceptible all the time. For part of what we're doing when we're reaching for those behaviors is we're self-medicating to soothe the senses. One of the beauties of Ayurveda is that all five senses are a part of the therapy. The beauty of yoga, all five senses have practices that go with them. 
And so th these portals are in the Manomaya Kosha, deeper than the Anamaya, deeper than the Pranamaya Kosha. Any questions on what I'm saying there? You ever find that you get a little derailed and you're you're having a behavior and you're once again like feeling alone in that behavior cycle? Like the world is going on around you and you just got into the breakdown lane. <laughs> there they go. So I, I want to underline the second recommendation that I made there, which is these portals of empathy or connection about it, not to think of ourselves as alone in the struggle. Um, and let me go to Farah. Yeah, this conversation is so real for me the past couple of weeks of trying to have a daily practice and noticing the sort of my mindset when it starts to slip away and feeling like wanting to really, really protect it. But of course, like the busier my life gets, the harder that is. Um, and so anyway, it's just a really, really relevant dis um, discussion right now. What I was going to ask you that would be helpful for me personally is the last thing you talked about, about um, the porosity of our senses and um, cleaning them or clearing them or, or treating them. I was I would love to have a couple of examples of like I, I definitely have HSP level neurodivergence and but also PTSD and like who knows which came first, the chicken or the egg. But um, I would love to know a little bit more about maybe a couple of examples of how you might treat that with asana or with um, like treating all five senses. I like the idea of that, but it's a bit abstract. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. So let me get the light to turn on again. <laughs> um, well, some of the common practices that we have access to, such as chanting, is a very important practice for the sense of sound and also the vibration that it creates and how it increases vagal tone, nitric oxide, and therefore resilience overall. I recommend that we don't have um, distressing sounds in our environment to the extent that we have control over that. So for a, a long time, I recommended that my students drive in silence, don't turn on the radio or the news, or even really, you don't need to, to play music, but you could play soothing music to help you if you are driving a car. If there are sounds in your environment that are distressing to find even uh, your form of white noise, for me, it's a tambora, a ragini box that I'm that is playing it's often. I turn it on in my home when I just need to set the ambiance. Another thing that's very helpful to me and that I do recommend for people is to have a practice of burning something. It's a ritual. I burn the um, sandalwood powder in the morning. It's like an incense, but it's a powder. I form it into a little cone and then I light it with a, a, a match. So the sandalwood powder is making the fragrance. It's a very sattvic fragrance. Sometimes you can ask an Ayurvedic practitioner to tell you which fragrances are best for you to have in your personal environment, but sandalwood powder is sattvic and kind of um, universal in that regard. Or another form of incense that you find to be helpful, a fragrance that can be in your environment to help that sense orient to the beauty of the present moment. We also use fire, so we light something to help smudge, for example, smudging your space and clearing energy. Um, when I was helping Christina and Jackie with their retreat at Brighton Bush, they were doing a lot of healing work, indigenous healing, that's where they come from, that's their tradition, and they could feel that some of the students who had arrived brought things with them, like an entity or an energy that they then had taken on. So in the house where we were staying at Brighton Bush, they did the practice of how, how to clear their own energy for those things not to be with them. And I imagine that in a lot of the work you've done, Farah, you've been exposed to people's darker sides or more difficult sides. And some of the peace and reconciliation work that you've done internationally, you may still be carrying something that's not yours. And so a, a smudging practice or a ritual like that that clears your field and also has a it has a fragrance to it. It can help to clear that out. For the visual field, uh, we don't recommend a lot of overhead lights or you know the amount of electricity that we put on our faces here in this 
um, modern day thing we call living, um, but rather to have the lights adjusted to be sattvic for you at the times of day where you can do that and to have more natural light where possible to be in the sunlight as much as it's available to you. In New Mexico, you have a nice opportunity there. And then to shield the eyes from something too strong or too direct on your face. Um, it can be distressing to the nervous system. As well, using an eye mask, uh, when you have a resting period, actually putting the eye mask on so the eyes are made more still by that, or an eye pillow, um, and giving the eyes a chance for some blackout time. I call it my blackout mask time, but I, I also need that. And then giving the eye something beautiful to look at, something like I have several Mortis in this house. A Morty is like a little statue um, or to know where there's beauty that can be seen. And we spend time using beauty to gaze on like a, you could use a flower. You can even use a flower that's, it's going to bloom and it's going to compost and you'll see it go through all of its life stages. But we also use like a, a yantra uh, an illustration that is made, a specific kind of yantra made for you that you can gaze at for meditation and it can be very calming to the eyes. Candle gazing meditation is also recommended and can be very helpful to the busy mind to gaze at the candle, at the center of the candle that's not moving. Then there's the flame that is moving, but to gaze at the part of the candle that's not moving. For the skin, for the sense of touch, of course in Ayurveda, we recommend the abhyanga, having the oil on the skin. So it's also like giving yourself a buffer. Your skin is the largest immune organ in your body. So treating it like that, like it's your protective layer and giving it the appropriate oil for yourself. And if you don't know which oil that is, use sesame oil. I'll just go for the basics. Don't spend a lot of time on research and then it's months before you've implemented <laughs> start with the sesame oil on the body and care for your skin in that way so wearing clothing that feels comfortable and generally speaking my teachers especially my vedic teachers would recommend that you're wearing cotton clothing and nothing that's been um, fabricated from other materials to keep it you know they consider to be more sattvic to wear that kind of fabric versus polyester, for example. Are those some helpful things for you? Yeah, I do every single one of those because I'm an HSP, so I've learned to survive that way. But I think I was imagining, it's really helpful to hear all of that. I think I was imagining that maybe you meant practices that would help fortify the porosity of the senses, and maybe these do, maybe these are the ways of doing that. I mean, it certainly has felt protective to me to create uh, those protections. Mm -hmm. I think I was imagining maybe there are other ways <laughs> to mm -hmm. add to that repertoire or so, or maybe there's actually practices or even um, through things like Panchakarma and such to maybe clear out the residues, but to have a way to fortify against such porosity, but it's really challenging in the world because the world is very loud and very fast. Yeah. I can I can see how these are protective. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes, in terms of then um, fortifying the senses, we're really looking at that through uh, a couple things. One would be meditation, where you don't let the senses leave. You're able to keep calling them back and calling them back and calling them back. And another would be uh, using ujjayi breathing because it has such an ability to focus. So pranayama, particularly ujjayi, can be so helpful for the focus of the mind, and that includes the focus of the senses. Um, Panchakarma is profoundly helpful for reducing the wear and tear on the senses overall. And in clearing those out, you'll probably need fewer of the other things to keep your senses protected. Right? So there's a, there's a whole reciprocal relationship with that. Insofar as we clear out the debris, we need less to maintain that then. Yeah, I think that's what I was getting at with that question. So thank you. You know, and you just start making choices about where not to go shopping <laughs> or, you know, which um, I'm sure you've done this too, but in case any other, anybody else would benefit from it, like 
turn off the notifications and the sound associated with them and the badges and the alerts and all the things that are assaulting people all day in this in the name of efficiency and connection um, and yeah reduce your stimulus where where you can that being said if we reduce the stimulus reduce the stimulus reduce the stimulus and we aren't also doing like meditation or ujjayi pranayam or strengthening the senses giving them this beautiful exposure we may be making our bandwidth smaller and smaller and smaller until we feel that isolation again that can lead to disconnection and dissociation so we do want to be careful that we don't lose the portals of empathy we just have like three degrees of life that we can live and outside of that we feel like too precious or fragile Thank you for your question, Kara. Okay, yes, Brianna, thank you. So let's ask, uh, we can talk to Christina and Jackie about that when they come. We can especially ask Jackie since she's a part of your mentoring uh, in some of the small cohorts. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I'd like to finish with a practice that we can do for a few minutes together, and then we'll we'll close. It won't be a long practice, but a few minutes of time together. So please take a comfortable seat. Find your place. You're welcome to close your eyes. Allow yourself to listen to whatever the sounds are in your surround environment. And then listen to this sound, which I'll be chanting to you. So hum. So hum So hum So hum to wash through you, I am. So hum, that I am, hum saham. We are all that is and all that has been and all that will be. To know this, the mind from Krishnamurti needs to be deeply still and very quiet.
Thank you for being portals of empathy for each other this evening. Let's bring the hands together at the heart. Remind yourself that every moment that you regain some leadership is a moment of confidence in yourself that you can do it. Thank you very much. Namaste. Thank you all for being here. And I look forward to seeing you in the class tomorrow morning as well. Have a wonderful evening.